Dear important person in my life, greetings and salutations. I hope this letter finds you well. I write this to inform you that I am no longer able to play the role of the prodigal dandy who left our village so many eves ago. Rather, ere next you see me, it shall be as the belle I have always secretly been. It is my hope that you find it within yourself to meet the situation with compassion, as the relationship we share is unique and valuable to me, and I would be devastated to see it dashed upon the cliffside like so many forlorn intentions. Please know that I am aware that understanding may not come with ease, but I am happy to help guide you there in whatever capacity you allow. Should you have any questions, please do not tarry to write back. Forever yours, Mila. OMG, that's so amazing. What do you think your girl style is going to be? Welcome to the team. BTW, you need to start using emojis and exclamation marks more. Laughing, crying face. Using a period means you hate me. Kissy face. Cool stuff. Um, are we still playing Overwatch later? Wait, what? Are you kidding? There were no signs. I'm sorry, but you just don't seem very feminine to me. Why didn't you say anything sooner? Why did you wait so long? When I first started transitioning, I was given some literature from a few concerned individuals in my life by one Mr. Walt Heyer, a born-again detransitioner who has found his purpose later in life by grifting religious institutions, grieving family members of trans individuals, and a small number of other detransitioners who share his belief that, since transition didn't work for him, it must be wrong for everyone. I would love to make a full-length video on Ol Walt and fully intend to, but it's taken me more than a year to get through about half of the two books of his given to me, so that's still a long way off. However, I must still credit him with inspiring me to make this video. Well, inspiring me to make the blog post that would eventually inspire me to make this video. You know, whatever. Also, what is the legality of posting an annotated copy of a book? Does anyone know? I mean, just asking for a friend, one who would love to share such an annotated work once it's finished, but only if they won't be sued into the sun for it. But if you do know anything, you should let me know in the comments. So when I was reading through one of Walt's books, this wretched thing in fact, I kept seeing this name pop up as an expert voice on trans issues, Laura Amato. There was something about that name that I just couldn't quite grasp. A shred of a memory long and rightly buried. Laura Amato. God, who was she? Eventually, when I started cross-referencing each of his citations, I saw another name, even more familiar and emotionally bound. Laura's Playground. Laura's Playground. Fucking Laura's Playground. What were those pennies in my mouth? Or was it actually the smell of toast coming over me? A URL was included with the citation. This URL, lauras-playground.com. I looked it up. It brought me here, transgenderpulse.com. There was no Laura's Playground. It was a figment of my imagination. And apparently, Walt's which was believable considering the book's seventh citation is from IlluminatiNews.com. IlluminatiNews.com. I moved on with my reading. But each time Laura's was cited, I had this weird shudder run down my spine. It had to be a thing. I needed to know. I headed to archive.org. Holy... This was that website, that one that I remembered, the sickeningly pink thing with glitter and so many 
butterflies. I had been here. I remembered it. I can't believe I found it. What is this? What is that? Captain Lammers! Nice read, Velma. People watching this video are primarily going to be in one of two camps. The first is made up of cis and younger trans people or trans folk who only realized they were trans relatively recently. The second is made up of older trans folk who, at most, whisper up the subject at hand in the furtive tones of repressed trauma. r slash trans and trans twitter eat your heart out. This video is about the forgotten history of the transgendered internet of the new millennium. What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? I have had access to a computer for as long as I can remember. My dad used AutoCAD to plot power plant schematics and diagrams and such, and so I was playing Wolfenstein and Cosmos Cosmic Adventure on our CompuAd computer from the time I was like three or four. When I was about seven, we got our first PC with internet access, a Packard Bell. At first, I was not given full internet access, but instead had to go through Packard Bell's proprietary kiddo net, itself a piece of ancient forgotten internet history. KiddoNet did not include a web browser, so it would still be another couple of years before I could ask Jeeves things myself. I'm guessing I was around 9, maybe 10 when that first finally happened. I know I spent a lot of time on Lego.com back then. There was a cool 3D Lego spaceship thing that I vaguely remember liking to explore, but the first thing I actually remember typing into an open search engine? I want to be a girl. One of the things I try to emphasize time and again on this channel is that trans people have always existed. If they existed 150 years ago, they certainly existed 20 years ago. A search query like that, it led me to the trans internet, but what I was introduced to at the tender age of 10 was nothing like the anime memes and egg jokes of today. No, the place I stumbled into was much, much darker. I should pause here to make a little disclaimer. I feel conflicted writing this video, just as I did when I first wrote about this topic a year ago or so. I think that this is extremely important trans history to document and discuss, but I don't want the deeply negative emotions I have towards these traumatic memories to be taken out of context. In her most recent video, Cringe, ContraPoints made a distinction between in-group cringe and out-group cringe, stating, In-group cringe is when you cringe at someone who belongs to the same group identity as you. For example, your family, your romantic partnership, your ethnicity, or your country, particularly if they're embarrassing themselves in front of outsiders to the group. I'm about to discuss a lot of things that made my transness very difficult for me for nearly two decades. It comes from a place of wanting people to better understand other trans people like me, not one that seeks to elicit further scorn from transphobes. Anyway, let's continue. The spaces I ended up in online can broadly be sorted into two categories. Wow, I'm doing this a lot in this video, sorry. Straight up porn. Well, there was nothing straight about it, but you know. And sites like Laura's Playground. Both helped delay my transition until I was nearly 30. I mostly just want to talk about Laura's and sites like it in this video, but before I can do that, I think it's important to have a little chat about the phenomenon known as the narrative. The very first thing I can remember occurred one day when my aunt was watching me. Her daughter, happened to be almost my exact age. And so during those early years, we were very close. Of course, her toys were very different from mine, not to mention more numerous. A collection I looked on with envy. In fact, so large was her toy collection that she had a whole separate room dedicated to the ones that wouldn't fit in her bedroom. I was not allowed in there, but that doesn't mean I never wandered in to gaze upon the silicone shrine. 
One day, while I was in there alone, I came across a toy makeup kit. I can't say exactly what it consisted of. I was not yet even in elementary school. But what I do remember was a beautiful plastic tube of lipstick. I could feel my heart pounding. And in the silence of that lonely room, it was the only thing I could hear. Slowly, I reached for it and held it in my hand for a long time. To say that I was entranced would be a poetically appropriate hyperbole. I was entranced. Looking around, I discerned that no one else was near. Slowly, methodically, I released that ruby red idol from its three cent cap. I looked in the cheap foil mirror in the plastic vanity I was sitting at. Funny how such ancient details can come back when writing about them. Doing as I had seen other women do, I held my pursed lips slightly agape, and after another pregnant pause, began rubbing it all over them. The stick was wet. It must be real. I smiled until someone called my name. Quickly, I recapped the faux lip stain and ran outside. God knows why that tube was wet, because it was definitely hard plastic. For some reason, I later reasoned that it had been in water or something. Who knows, but at the time, I convinced myself that it was real and that my lips were permanently girly and pretty because of it. This was my first secret, and I loved it. Later, it would also be the first time I felt acute shame for wanting to be able to do what girls do. The first coal in a slowly building blaze of self-hatred. While transition is still not an easy road and remains inaccessible for many, in an age of informed consent clinics, the sort of gatekeeping we see now pales compared to even 10 years ago. The narrative refers to the sort of by-the-book story trans people were de rigueur required to parrot to therapists, doctors, and psychs in order to be allowed to pursue medical transition, that is, to legally obtain hormones and surgeries. For trans women, this meant a story which included the following details. Early childhood memories of wanting to be a girl, a history of cross-dressing from a young age, a will to fully encapsulate the submissive feminine role, and an insatiable appetite for dick, paralleled with a hatred for one's own. Things that could earn you bonus points included playing with dolls, wearing your mother's heels or pearls, and using the magic words, I just feel like I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. Failing to do enough of these things meant that you weren't really trans, and thus were unfit for medical transition. I'm less familiar with the trans mask experience, but in all the ways that trans women were expected to embody a toxic stereotype of femininity, trans men were expected to be avatars of toxic masculinity. At any rate, the community of the before times was under the constant shadow of the narrative, which meant that many of us who either transitioned or were questioning during that era ended up internalizing it as a necessary proof of one's transness. The example I gave earlier, that was part of my narrative. My third post in the blog I started when my egg finally started to crack back in 2017. It's so cringy for me to go back to now because while the story there is true, It is absolutely written in the prose of the narrative. I was trying to not only prove to myself that I was trans enough, 
But more importantly, I was trying to prove the same to anyone who might eventually come across it in the future. The narrative is sort of a running joke among many trans women my age. ContraPoints has poked at it a few times in her videos, but it's a dark sort of humor. For many of us, the perceived need to be a hyperbolic cliché of femininity in order for wider society to accept us as normal began with the narrative. Laura's Playground is a perfect example of the pervasive, toxic influence of the narrative. Its entire site design, while also generally a product of its time, seriously, turn-of-the-century website aesthetic was the height of tastelessness just screams, look, girl things. I mean, seriously, I know I already made a dramatically big deal about it earlier, but still, to use the common parlance of the tran, big oof. Sites like Laura's were a vehicle for my disassociation when I was younger. Sure, I might have been typing things like, I want to be a girl into any search engine that would have me, and yeah, I had a weird thing for like a week after watching the direct of VHS Land Before Time 4 Journey Through the Mists where I pretended to be Ollie, Littlefoot's female cousin, in an attempt to dream about being her at night. And fine, I will concede that I spent most of those nights and all others for several years in tears while I prayed for God to let me wake up the next morning as a girl. Sue me, who hasn't had a similar childhood? But when those search results brought me to places like Laura's, I knew one thing for certain. I was nothing like any of the people I found. While I had very little of a sexual awakening to speak of during puberty, I was still pretty sure I liked girls, if only because I felt nothing romantic or sexual when presented with the masculine. The narrative? sounded very little like anything I had experienced, and all the trans women I found online who weren't porn stars were removed from me by several generations. I didn't know what I was, but I definitely wasn't a transsexual, so I just didn't think about it. Except when I did. Later, this contributed to me internalizing a belief that I was just a pervert with a fetish for femininity, which was far from a healthy headspace for me to occupy, let alone for as many years as I occupied it. I'm talking about all of this from a place of personal experience using a single website as an example, but I do want to point out that there were loads of other websites like it, and there are loads of other trans women who experienced similar trauma from them. Of all the posts on my old blog, there was never a single one that even came close to being as trafficked and responded to as mine on Laura's Playground. I was actually more nervous about that post than any other when I published it, because it comes from a very negative place and I worried that there would be many people who would be angry at me for my take on it. More on this in a moment. Overwhelmingly though, those who commented on it thanked me for discussing something that isn't really talked about all that much telling me that it had caused similar long-term trauma for them. I even made a few friends from it. What's wild is that Lara's and other similarly named websites aren't nearly as ancient a phenomenon as they seem, despite the Space Jam design language. Lara's playground didn't disappear until the early 2010s, and some even still exist. This means that the same horrors I experienced as a middle schooler in the early aughts can still be found by middle schoolers in the neo-roaring 20s. And when I say horrors, I mean horrors. Um, I've never met anyone who wanted to be transsexual or transgendered. It is not a lifestyle choice. It is something people like us have from birth. It is a birth condition? Mm, not a voluntary behavior. Okay, so there are worse words that could be used, but... Mm. Who would choose this life? Who would subject themselves to years of ridicule, pain, and suffering if they could stop it? Okay, I used to actually feel this way myself, but for the record, I'm pretty happy with where I'm at now and am pretty cool with being trans. Um, if you saw... Ooh. 
If you saw a person in a wheelchair, you could see their disability. You'd never dream of making fun of them. So, God, I knew this is where it was going. So why ridicule tran folk who hat tran folk? Hmm. So why ridicule tran folk who have a disability through no fault of their own? That is horrifying. Ugh. After one attempt, I made the terrible mistake of calling a suicide hotline. Wait, the terrible mistake of calling a suicide hotline. I needed to talk to someone desperately. It took me half an hour to convince them not to come get me and lock me up in the nut ward. <laughs> nut ward. I finally talked her out of it, but I never did get to talk or tell her what my problem was. One valuable lesson I've learned is if you ever need to call someone to talk because you're depressed, the last place to call... No, God, the last place to call is a suicide hotline? They just want to lock you up, not help you? <sighs> so I understand her having a bad experience, but... That's pretty bad. Girl's Life, Transgendered Women's Health, Living, and Fashion. So why call the link to this page Girl's Life? After all, who knows better than someone who's been gender confused than to use stereotypes? Of course, it's not just for girls. Lots of guys read Dear Abby and lots of women read the sports page. Ah, uh, but in what order do they read them in? Before female hormones, I used to read the news first, then the sports and comics, and the living section last, if at all. <laughs> no. After a few months of female hormones, I read the news first, living second, and once in a while, the sports and comics. I even started so... <laughs> I even started sewing suddenly. I never expected that. Hormones are domesticating me. <laughs> I may have to make a poll about this as soon as I figure out how to word it. <laughs> Jesus, oh my god. It would be irresponsible of me not to mention the fact that, back when there was a total lack of positive trans representation in media and wider society, websites like Laura's did show some trans women that they weren't alone, that there were others like them. That is a comfort, even if it was not one which was afforded to me. Those who did have something more positive to say about such spaces typically have the opinion that, while they weren't perfect, they were the only places that made them feel like a normal person. There is something to be said for that, and because of it, I don't want this to simply be a video of me dunking on a thing that legitimately helped some people 15 years ago. However, the fact that some trans women were able to find a comfort in Laura's playground doesn't erase the fact that it actively delayed my own transition and caused me psychological trauma that I'm only just now getting past, and that it did the same to so many others. The stereotypes that such places played into isolated a huge swathe of the community and provided fodder that many transphobes still use to justify their bigotry today. I mean, I was given the book that cited Laura Amato just last year. I think that it's important to document this type of trans history both in order to better understand the context of the period it was produced in and so that we trans and cis people alike can learn from it and do better in the future. Greater trans visibility has equated to a more concentrated sort of transphobia than existed even 10 years ago, but that does not mean that society is more transphobic now than it was then. Quite the contrary. Trans people were, until very recently, so marginalized that many people were not even aware of their existence. While this might sound like a good thing in theory, in practice it meant that a huge percentage of trans folk, like me, didn't even realize that the source of at least part of their misery was due to the fact that they were trans. Transphobia was so tightly woven within the fabric of our societal sensibility that it was simply the norm. 
Yes, we are a population that the far right has adopted as the poster child of degeneracy, and thus we are the recipients of a very overt sort of hate from them. But there has also never been a time in our history when trans people have been more widely accepted. There are more allies now than ever before, and I am constantly stunned by the number of parents I see who just want their trans child to live the happiest and best lives they can provide for them. So yeah, things suck now, but one doesn't have to spend very long on archive.org to realize they were far, far worse just a few years ago. There's still a lot of work to be done, but it is actually being done. I mean, just look at how far the trans aesthetic has come. Not a single butterfly in sight. I was nearly finished with this video when George Floyd was murdered by the Minneapolis police, and while I did decide to go ahead and finish it, I wanted to take a moment to recognize that tragedy, as well as the protests that have since sprung up against the systemic racism so endemic to this country. I have recently started a Patreon and would like to take a moment to thank Raphael, Epri Jeffstein, Masterike Now, Salt, and all the other patrons and voice actors who helped make this video possible. I have donated all my pledges from last month and this month to the Louisville Community Bail Fund and will do so with any other pledges I might receive this month. For those who would also like to help but cannot participate in a protest or donate to a bail fund, I am including a link in the description to a YouTube playlist full of videos that are donating 100% of their ad revenue to Black Lives Matter. You don't even need to actively watch any of them, just leave it running in the background. Though, I will say, some are genuinely good, and many even highlight black creators you can support. Either way, just remember to turn your ad blocker off. Thanks for watching, everyone.